Welcome to this Autism Ontario webinar. Start here, a parent's guide to focus on ASD. Today, we are very lucky to have with us Dr. Peter Zatmari, Chief of Child and Youth Mental Health Collaborative, Sick Kids, CAMH, and U of T, and the co-author of a book that we're gonna be talking about today. This is Dr. Zamari's first time on the uh, on the desk, and uh, and Peter, I'd like to welcome you. Usually, we do this in a studio, but today we're both doing it virtually from our hometown of Hamilton. Thanks Hi, for everybody. Being. Great. Before we get started, I've got some housekeeping items. Uh, real quick, everyone, there's a few things you need to know if you've never been to one of these before, and that is you can ask a question at any time. They will be sent to me, and I will aspire to get you answers from um, from Dr. Zamari. We've got over 300 people online with us today. We've had questions flowing in from before this webinar started, so I don't believe we're going to be able to get you all the questions, but as normal, we'll get to as many as we can, and those that we cannot answer, we are going to aspire to get to you afterwards. Um, we will be referring to, of course, the PowerPoint slides today, as well as we've got a number of resources that help inform our discussion. We'll be talking about those as well. If you have any issues, comments, or concerns, go ahead and click the help button and we will be there to assist you. Okay, um, let's bring back Peter and let's talk about, first off, um, we're talking about some of the core items here. We're going back to what feels like basics. You know, what is ASD? What are some of the risk factors that cause ASD? Why is it important to be talking about these items right now? Um, sure. Thank Autism Ontario for inviting me to be part of this. It's fantastic to do this uh, virtually. And I think we're discovering the potential of virtual communication that we never thought possible. Well, Matt, there's been a lot of new information. All right, Peter, I think you've been, I think we're losing you a bit there. If you can hear me, I think we're losing you a bit um, and cutting in and out. Um, so um, I'm going to ask you to do uh, just to hold on one moment here. As I uh, as I confirm that um, real quickly. Just give me a second. Sorry, everyone. All right. Um, I'm just going to speak to our producer right now, Mike. We we dropped out audio on on Peter again, and I'm going to look to see if you can um, drop that, uh, bit rate one more time. And when we do that, I'm going to give everybody some exciting information after this, uh, after this false start. Sorry about this, everyone, but something really, um, exciting about this is that we mentioned that, uh, Peter is an author and we are going to be randomly giving away, um, some of his books today. So we will be doing that throughout the course. Uh, afterwards we'll be doing a draw and you will hear from Autism Ontario if you are one of the, one of the winners. So, so back to you, Pete. We see you've, uh, Peter, we see you've reconnected. Um, talk to us a little bit again about, uh, start from the beginning of that question, why is this important and, uh, and uh, to talk about today. So first of all, I'm really grateful to Autism Ontario for the invite. Very pleased to be part of this exciting initiative and way to communicate with people uh, on a broad basis. You know, there's been, Matt, a lot of new information about autism spectrum disorder in the last five years or so. Technology, better understanding of treatments, what All right, we've um, we're losing you again, Peter. I am sorry. We're going to have to bump you down to audio. I think I think Mike's going to do that for us um, in a moment. Uh, I apologize to everyone out there. Um, you know, we talked about you know Peter did say about the possibilities of this technology um, in testing. We we were good, um, and uh, and now. Um, and now we are we are experiencing this issue. We're going to give one more uh, one more item, Peter. And if um, if this doesn't work, we're going to give you a phone number to dial in on, and I will do my best to uh, to uh, continue to uh, to. 
by time. But Peter, uh, can you go ahead and give us a test? We've got you on audio now. Testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. Coming through really, really good. So where we lost you, you had talked about, you were talking about how there's been a lot of new information um, within within the ASD community. What is that new information and, and what has been coming to light over the past couple of years? Well, I think there's a much better understanding of what autism is and what some of the key difficulties and impairments might be with respect to the disorder. We've got a bet better understanding of what causes the disorder. And most importantly, I think a better understanding of sort of evidence-based uh, treatments. And one of the really hot topics are the mental health comorbidities that uh, often challenge kids and adolescents in particular. So I thought I might touch on those as well. Okay. So the first topic that we were talking about is, you know, what is autism spectrum disorder? Um, I think that a lot of us feel like we know, those of us who are in the community or probably a lot of the parents that are online right now. Um, but, but you know, what is it? Let, let's go back to the basics and start there. Yeah, so I think strengths. So Leo Kanner once said is if you've seen one kid with autism, you've seen one kid with autism. And I think we really have to appreciate how many different types and patterns there are uh, in kids with the disorder. The two main impairments and difficulties have to do with social communication and secondly, repetitive stereotyped behaviors. All kids with ASD have some kind of cognitive difficulty. And then there's a mixed number of kids that also have medical problems, comorbid health. Okay, so um, uh, Peter, I, I don't know what has happened in the internet. Um, too much Netflix in the neighborhood or something like that, but we're, we're, we're losing you again. Um, what I'm going to do is I am going to basically um, ask that you look at the chat and in the chat there is going to be a phone number and that phone number will allow you to connect uh, via backup to that number and will if you have a cell phone handy or a, another phone handy you can go ahead and do so and at, when you're back I will hear you and um, and I will uh, we can pick up the dialogue until then I'm gonna have to talk about a few things here and I am going to talk about the there's a number of items that are that are in the handout section here and and really want to apologize to everyone for the issues that have been been going on here but um, one of the things that um, that we that we've got in here uh, as we mentioned before that we're going to be giving away is um, this this book um, start here a parent's guide to helping children and teens through mental health challenges and within that book there it's um, it's a co-author uh, by dr. Zamari as well as pure uh, Bryden and this is a book that we're all real excited about here at autism Ontario as it really provides what we aspire to do on these webinars and what we look to do is um, basically um, being able to um, um, educate parents and caregivers and the like and so there's a link there if you go ahead and you look in the resources um, section of the of, of the website I'm gonna go ahead and just bring some um, attention to that right now um, you'll see that there is a link to it there where you can learn more more about it um, there are a number of, of different items that we've got here including um, 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 information from autism Ontario about where to get help and it should be noted that there is a brand new website called uh, part of the autism Ontario website which we call connecting virtually and in that section of the website you're able to get access to um, uh, everything from the um, um, you're able to get access to everything from the uh, 
um, connecting with the uh, uh, people in the community, the service navigators, as well as getting all of the archives from these these various uh, these various events. Um, it looks to me like we've got um, we've got. I'm just going to go ahead and check to see if we've got Doctor reconnected. Um, Gonna make sure we bring him back um, into the frame. As soon as uh, we, we've connected him back, we'll just ask him to talk. So I'm just waiting for that confirmation. So check out the connecting virtually section of the website, as well as um, a couple great links about where you can get help in this time and information on this book, which is uh, which is something that has been um, um, that we're going to be talking about um, more throughout this presentation when we get uh, when we get a good doctor back. Um, okay. Um, okay. Phone number in the chat box. All right. So I can hear you, uh, right now, doctor. Have you dialed in on the phone or are you still connected by webcam via your computer? I'm by computer. I don't see the phone number in the chat box. Okay. Excellent. I am going to, um, repost it if the chat is on the um on the left hand side near where you saw all of our photos oh it's not in the q a no it's not in the q a sir it's there's the chat that we have over on the on the right hand side there And what I'm going to do as well, sir, is I'm going to email it to you. So you've got that um, and from the meeting that we had uh, that we had yesterday. So it'll be in your inbox in two moments. Yeah, I don't see it in the chat box either. Mm. Send it to me by email. Yeah, I've done so far. So you should have that in uh, in just a moment. Well, I've got you here, um, and well, we've still got this connection. Before we get into the deep uh, portion of the content, can you give me the origins of this book? Why did you, you and uh, your co-author there decide that um, that it would make sense to, to to write this book at this time? Well, the book is really an attempt to help parents navigate the mental health system for kids with mental health conditions, and including autism spectrum disorder. Right. It's crazy out there. I can appreciate that. Very difficult to navigate the system. So we thought an important uh, support for parents would be to give them some basic knowledge about the different mental health conditions, what causes them, how to prevent them, what are the evidence-based treatments, and how to access services. And we illustrate each of the conditions with a story that I think brings to life some of the issues that we raise, particularly around uh, treatments that are available. So that was the basic reason. Okay. Um, while we're waiting for that email to come in, uh, you know, the idea of case-based or story-driven um, is a great way of learning, and, and it's a great way that we, we, we do it here. And so we've got a question that came in um, before this even started, and it's a question. I'm wondering if this is the kind of thing that you, that you would address in the book. And it's a parent who's having struggles with their high school um, child's homework. Um, basically, during COVID, they're they're using Google Classroom, and um, and basically he's getting frustrated because he doesn't have some of the in, I guess the in classroom supports that he would normally have in the school. And the question breaks down to he gets frustrated, um, and he's like wants to walk away from it when he normally does pretty well in school. Do you have any suggestions specifically for that, or is that the kind of thing that the book would even would even um, address? I'm just writing down the last numbers here, nine seven. No okay, so it's a, it's a great question, and one of the obviously things that many parents are struggling with with the COVID nineteen um, pandemic. Right, and I think the issue is to think about. Uh, homework as a behavior that's stressful for kids 
to try and understand what actually is stressful about doing homework and what are the consequences of avoiding doing homework and to try and reduce whatever stresses precipitate homework refusal and change the uh, consequences so that there's a reward for completing homework. So things like, you know, what are the favorite subjects for doing homework? Start with that. If there's a difficult part of homework, like math, for example, have a reward available for once math has been completed. Right. Um, so those are the kinds of things. Break, break it down into its component parts and then reward each of the parts to making homework a successful activity. And you know what, this is something that, that we, we, we have heard before and I assume that, um, you know, similar things should be going on in the classroom. Um, the next question that we see came in here is about cooperation. Um, do you have strategies or do you talk about any um, in the book with those, with those on the spectrum who don't want to cooperate with the doctors or anyone who's trying to give them assistance? And this is, this is coming from another, you know, teenagers are difficult anyways, but this is coming from another parent of a teenage, uh, a teenage person on the spectrum. Right. So, uh, so that's not uncommon. Um, uh, I, you know, I will emphasize. All right, Doctor. Well, we've hit the uh, the last snag that we're going to be able to uh, address here on the uh, on the webcam. So, I think what I'm going to ask you to do is to is to go ahead and connect on the um, connect on the phone line that you wrote down. Mm -hmm. And while you're doing that, I will once again um, basically uh, uh, buy some time. I'm watching um, the feed here to know when it is that you're brought back, Mike. If you want to remove him from the stream, and let me know when he's back, and we can have a we can have a chat when we go to audio. So um, sorry again, everyone. Uh, we're doing our best here, but when we connect back in using plain old telephone lines, that should be the answer to our to our audio issues. And what we are going to do when we get back is we're going to dive into um, <clears throat> the presentation in a more wholehearted way because we're we're 18 minutes into our our. Um, our, our show now and clearly we haven't gotten through what we want to but um, the reason that we're so excited about the book at Autism Ontario is, is just that is just the idea that there is a lot of stories that help um, address some of these some of these issues and what you'll find is that you know as as Peter had started saying it's not that uncommon uh, for folks to um, uh, for kids in their teens to go through those sorts of issues so um, it is something that um, that does come up and uh, Peter, when you're back, if you could just go ahead and say hello, um, and we'll get you. Hello. Uh, all right. <laughs> all right. Hello. All right. You are back and you are sounding, uh, you're sounding like you're coming in clear here. So where we just were was you were talking about, um, you were talking about uh, the, the um, not uncommon for teenagers to be, how shall we say it, um, adversarial or not cooperating with the help that they have in place. Talk to me a little bit about that. Okay, so, um, you know, it's very common. It's very common in typical kids. And sometimes it just takes a little while to get used to it. So, you know, even a visit to the doctor's office beforehand without seeing the doctor or coming into the, you know, and greeting the nurse or the receptionist uh, and just and then going home after that. So trying to accomplish that goal in small steps. I also wanted to emphasize how much you can do by just talking to the doctor without the kid. You can provide a lot of information. And maybe I'll say one of the other things I've learned in this pandemic uh, and the use of virtual care is actually it's easier for me to talk to kids with ASD by virtual care, like over Zoom or one of these platforms, than it is face to face. Uh, That's interesting. Kids seem to be, yeah, it's like somehow kids seem to be a bit more relaxed talking to me over the computer than face to face. You know, they make a long trip to come and see me. You know, parents have to pay for parking. I apologize about that. 
think it's totally unfair, but it's not my decision. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's stressful coming to the doctor. I get it. And sometimes it's easier to do it virtually. And I'm really uh, impressed with how much good stuff can get done by, uh, you know, doing these health health assessments virtually. Do you think that, I mean, I don't know if it goes against what we're trying to do in, in some cases, but do you think that that may be one of the fallouts from, you know, what's going on right now is that it may become a, you know, even when people can come into the office, it may become an option for treatment going forward if, if, if it seems to be working better. Do you see your practice moving in that direction or is that, um, is that too much to, uh, to, to guess? Yeah, no, I think uh, all this is going to be part of the new normal. Um, now, I think for really young kids, it doesn't work as well because um, they have trouble sitting in front of the computer. You know, I see right. kids down to 18 months, months of age. It's not going to work for them. Right. Uh, there are times where it really is important for me to interact with the kids one-to-one, -one, to play with them, to hear what they say. Uh, how they talk, um, uh, you know, see what kind of toys they're interested in playing with. So that needs to be done one to one. Right. Uh, so I think it's going to be a mixture, but it's going to be, I'm pretty sure, a lot more use of virtual technologies than before. Okay, let's get back to the context. We got a lot to get through, and you've provided us with a uh, um, with a. Uh, diagram from the DSM-5. Is this an updated diagram? Is this one of the things that have changed over the last couple of years, or has this stayed uh, rather static? No, this is, uh, this is uh, the way it's been since with DSM-5. Let's move yeah. on to the next one. Sure. Um, I, you know, I've, I've put out here um, two cases, one of right. Johnny and then of a little girl after that. And I just wanted to illustrate how different these two kids are. And if let's go to the next one. Yeah. With Sally. Sally. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that we're really becoming aware of is that girls with ASD are different than boys with ASD. Uh, right. I don't know why this should surprise us, but it sure does. And one of the things we're learning is that actually how girls present may be different and we need a different sensitivity to the autism features in girls. Uh, uh, girls tend to be diagnosed later and that's right. unfortunate because they don't get the benefit of that early intervention and they're as a result of being diagnosed later often there's a lot of unfortunate experiences that, of school that get in the way. So that's why I just wanted to highlight the importance of the of what ASD looks like in girls. So it's improving though, right? I mean, there's, we do have mo more girls who are being, who are being um, diagnosed early with the awareness that is out there, or is that just wishful thinking on my part? Um, and we're still, we're still well behind the curve as it relates to that. You, you know what, uh, Matt, you're an optimistic person, but. <laughs> We Fair enough. Know. Fair enough. You know what? It takes 10 years for knowledge to influence clinical practice. There is a big time span in health, uh, in, in health, the health field between discovering something, learning something by research and getting sustained change in the field, you know, on the, on the front line of practice. Wow, that is staggering, uh, that's staggering to think. Yeah, this slide here on social trajectories that people uh, can see makes two really important points, again, about how different kids with ASD are. So these are from the ages of three to 14 years of age, and um, it reflects <clears throat> improvement in social skills over time between three and 14 years of age. And the point here is, is that there are different subgroups of kids who improve at different rates. And there is a different shape to 
how they improve. Some kids improve rapidly, and some kids improve much more slowly. So one of the important messages that everybody gets better with respect to their social skills from the early years to about 14, 15, and even later. So I think that illustrates how different kids with ASD are over time. But it also gives a very optimistic message, right? A lot, of, a lot of parents might be looking at that and looking at where their kid is on the curve. But the key here, as you mentioned, is everyone does improve. It's just a question of how, when, and, and, and uh, some of the supports, I guess, that can be put in place. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. This, Risk uh, factor. This slide, yeah, this slide looks at what causes autism. And uh, a lot of new knowledge here that's really, really important. Um, pretty well understood now that autism is a genetic disorder. Um, it is inherited to some extent, to a small extent. In other words, if there's a family history of ASD, there's an increased risk in, the, in another, another family member for ASD. But there are also genetic causes that arise spontaneously when the egg and the sperm come together to uh, cause the fetus. Sometimes there are little breaks and bits of DNA causing deletions or duplications, and that can cause autism. There's been a lot of recent research on environmental causes of autism. Usually they would interact with genetic factors to so advance parental age. So parents who are older than 40 more likely to have kids with ASD than under 40. Certain anticonvulsants that the mother might take during the pregnancy, like valproic acid, that can cause autism. And then other conditions during the pregnancy, like prematurity, diabetes, other medical conditions, they can also increase the risk. And I cannot emphasize enough, I do this, have to do this over and over again, uh, vaccinations, do not cause autism, full stop, underline. Neither do uh, infections, early infections, substance use in the parent uh, during the pregnancy don't seem to cause autism either, even though that is something that's in the popular press. Yeah, I was going to, uh, you beat me to it by getting to it. I was going to make a joke and talk about how, you know, a lot of people, I mean, it's it's in the non-autism community, in the general public, I mean, that seems to be what, the, unfortunately, the one thing that most people think they know is that vaccines are the are the root cause, which is a which is a huge myth that, you know, needs to be needs to be disproven. Um, there are a number of evidence based uh, treatments for ASD, <clears throat> things that um, um, that, 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 that help with it. Um, let's talk through the ones that you believe, um, that you believe we should be focusing on today. Okay. <clears throat> so there are two big categories of treatments. Ones that focus on the core impairments of ASD, the social communication and the repetitive stereotype behaviors. And then another set that focus on the comorbid conditions which I'll talk about a little bit later. So we're just going to focus now on social communication. And um, there is only one evidence-based treatment for the core difficulties. It's called applied behavior analysis. But real important to understand the terminology here. There are many, many different types of ABA, applied behavior yeah. analysis. But in general, ABA uh, sort of is a focus on, and I've talked about this before, antecedents, consequences, and behavior. So ABC is a really nice acronym for what applied behavior analysis is. Right. And there are, there are a number of very comprehensive treatment programs, early intensive behavioral interventions, uh, they target cognition, language skills, social skills, play and communication. And there's a spectrum of them. And this is the really exciting thing that's happened in the last five years or so, that a whole bunch of new ABA 
EIBI type interventions have come on the scene. The most, the, the oldest one is uh, at one end, it's highly structured adult directive, what we call discrete trial training. And more recently, a whole bunch of new, more naturalistic, developmentally appropriate child-led interventions, response training, PRT, Denver Early Start, Jasper is another one that I should have put there. So that's real exciting that we now have a variety of EIBI interventions that go from being really structured to more naturalistic and developmentally appropriate. So those are the comprehensive types of interventions. And then we can have more focused interventions that focus more specifically, say, on toileting, challenging behavior, et cetera. Right. And, you know, the, the message that I want to give parents is that we need to think of personalizing treatments. You know, no one form of ABA is appropriate for all kids with ASD throughout the lifespan, right? You have to be nimble. You have to personalize. What we know is that discrete trial training is, you know, works for those kids that have more limited skills, and it works early on, yeah, you know, two, three, four years of age. The more naturalistic developmental interventions are probably better suited for those kids with more advanced skills or later on in development, four, five, six, seven years of age. And, and the naturalistic interventions are better for social communication skills. Not everybody benefits. Not everybody gets better. So if these comprehensive treatments are not working, real important to continue with ABA, but focus now on more specific issues like feeding, toileting, life skills, safety, and so on. Right. And I just want to say one final thing um, is that, you know, some of these interventions, if they don't work, the kids get frustrated and then they start to get cranky and irritable. They don't want to participate because they know it's not working. They're bored with the intervention, so they want to yeah. do something else. Yeah, and that's something that we've already heard in a question um, to to a certain extent, as well as um, something that we hear quite a bit. And and um, we've talked about this a lot, especially with the changes in funding that have occurred in Ontario for for our group um, on the type of ABA that might be right. And a lot of parents focus on the um, on IBI or that or that um, the early the early intervention um, side of it. Um, you're just, I know you're not talking about, you know, which one is better than the others. Um, but, um, do you, do you generally see a process of, you know, that more intensive structure early on and a move towards personalization as you go through, or is it change for every child? Well, I think it's, it depends on where the kid is at the beginning, right? If they've got more cognitive skills, uh, more language, <clears throat> excuse me, more language, uh, and they've got more social skills than starting off with the more developmental Denver Early Start, PRT, social skills, training. That makes a lot more sense. So right. uh, it depends. It's a function of what are the basic, what's the basic skill level the kid has at the beginning and what's their potential. The danger is, if I may say, is sticking with an intervention that's not working too long and thinking that if it's not working, we should be doing more of it. No, that's not the right answer. Instead of doing more of it, we should switch and try a different intervention and get progress that way. Okay, makes sense. And um, so you, you mentioned that there's two sides. There is the co uh, comorbid mental health conditions that go along with um, that go along with ASD, um, and there's various a number, I'm assuming, of evidence-based treatments that go along with those. Um, so let's jump into that side of it. Great. So I think people are, uh, one of the other things that's happened in the last five years, how much attention people are paying to these comorbid mental health conditions. And so let's just go to the next slide. These are really common in aggregate these comorbid mental health conditions in ASD, 
across childhood, adolescence, and adulthood. More than 70% of people with ASD will have a comorbid mental health condition at some point in their life. <clears throat> they tend to start early in childhood and persist into adolescence. Uh, they can be really challenging and uh, important to consider in differential diagnosis. And the unfortunate news, uh, Matt, is that we don't have a lot of clinical practice guidelines or guidelines out there that help us in understanding what sort of treatment to use for these um, interventions. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. And this slide just illustrates that for a, in, a, in another study, a large group of adults, um, you know, they had on average six mental health conditions over their lifetime compared to non-ASD adults who had a mental health challenge who had on average three. Wow. Not only are you more likely to have one, you're more likely to have multiple different Oof. types uh, over right. the lifespan. What's what's the rationale or the reasoning? What do you think the rationale or reasoning is for that? Well, that's a that is a big uh, question, and I'm going to just show a little bit of data in childhood anyway. But we really don't know. I you have to say whether what, what causes these comorbid mental health conditions. Some may have shared genetic risk factors. Others may be the result of environmental life events like bullying in school or frustration in school. So it's a very complicated issue. Right. This slide sort of illustrates the most common types of uh, comorbid mental health conditions in childhood, adolescence, emerging adulthood, and late adulthood. NDD refers to neurodevelopmental disorders, which include ADHD and Tourette's or tics, learning disability, developmental coordination disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, you know, ODD is oppositional defiance disorder. I think the other ones are all sort of spelled out. Uh, we don't, re one of the things nobody's looked at is late adulthood. We know that in Ontario's nursing homes, there are people with autism that are undiagnosed. Do they have dementia earlier? We don't really know, but it's a, an important question to think about. Are there a lot, are, I mean, are there more studies going on now? Like I know that 10 years out from it being in the, in the doctor's office, but are there more studies that are going on now about, about this kind of thing? Yeah, so this is a very hot area of research and a lot of people Good. are, um, looking at this in, in some, some detail. Excellent news. Okay, principles of assessment. Yeah, so it's really complicated to try and sort out, uh, uh, you know, what is the ASD and what's, say, ADHD, attention deficit disorder, what's an anxiety disorder. So it takes some thought for the clinician to figure out what's explained, you know, is this behavior like not wanting to go to school, is that part of the ASD or is that part of the comorbid mental health condition? Right. And a really important is a thing to think about is that the, you know, does the comorbid mental health condition cause extra impairment over and above what's caused by the ASD? Right. And here's yeah. where, you know, some thought about what explains the onset and persistence of some of these comorbid mental health conditions, you need to delve closely into the history and ask the parents, you know, go with along with the parents and very carefully what, have, what emerged when and in what circumstances and what stresses were there to try and sort of sort this out. Is it that these comorbid mental health conditions don't display the same way in, with children with, a, with ASD or on the spectrum, or is it that some of the ways they do display could be one or the other causing it? You had mentioned not going to school. I'm assuming that could be anxiety or, you know, possibly the, you know, something related to, to being on the spectrum. So is it, is it more that, you know, it could be either or, or is it that it displays differently in the, in the child? So in a typically developing child, 
we use observations of their behavior, but also their self-report. So a kid who has ADHD, I will ask, you know, do you have trouble concentrating? Uh, a kid who's anxious, I'll ask that kid, do you feel anxious and worried? A kid who's depressed, do you feel sad and down in the dumps? Now, I can ask those questions of a kid with ASD if I'm wondering if they have a comorbid mental health condition, but I'm not sure I can always rely on that as well right. as I can with a kid with a typically developing kid with that condition. So we focus more on behavior and the insights of the parents, particularly who know the kids really well. And is there a change in behavior? That's also really important for these comorbid mental health conditions. So I'm just going to, to illustrate, I'm, let's just move ahead of the pathway study, which is our longitudinal study of kids that we've been following from two years of age. They're now 18 years of age. Maybe some of the folks in the audience are, are part of the pathway study team, but uh, really grateful for everybody's support uh, uh, in the study. Next slide. And we've focused on, you can skip that one. Uh, we focused on recently mental health problems, and I'm going to give a big shout out to the work of my colleagues in Pathways, Pat Miranda and Annette Zaidman Site, who've done all this fantastic work on what's causing anxiety and depression in kids with ASD uh, in early childhood. Next slide. And we've uh, focused on parenting distress and comorbid mental health conditions. And uh, parenting distress is, you know, the distress that you feel, the, the, the strain and stress of parenting a kid. And uh, that's certainly higher in parents of ASD kids than in other mental health conditions. And what we've learned is, is that there is this reciprocal relationship. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship and neither comes first in other words parenting distress can lead to an increase in comorbid mental health conditions those comorbid mental health conditions will lead to an increase in parent distress which leads to more mental health problems it's like there's a it's a snowball effect that and, and if if it's uninterrupted it can be quite become quite difficult to treat the longer it goes on. So okay. there's no one cause, but it's a reciprocal kind of relationship. And that's why it's real important to identify these comorbidities early on and treat them. And I just, I can't emphasize these lessons that we've learned about parent distress is influenced by the resources that the family has uh, you know, coping strategies, family functioning. And it's so important for our ASD services to include services to help the family cope, help them with parenting, help with family functioning as well. And all too often we separate these services into different uh, parts of the mental health system. You can if you go, go to the... Uh... If you go to the Connecting With Us Virtually section of the Autism Ontario website, you'll see that we've done a fair amount of talks and yeah. uh, and webinars on this topic as, as we've been tracking, like you have, Peter, the Pathway Study, and have been bringing in different, um, you know, um, in some cases, marriage counselors, different uh, different people who work in the field of, um, of family um, counseling, to talk about the importance of the situation the parents are in and how that affects the child and their capacity for being, you know, there and giving the supports to their children. So there's a lot of stuff um, there that you guys can go and check out. And uh, by, sorry for interrupting you before your big bottom line, uh, bottom line close on that, but I wanted to make sure that they were aware of that. No, no, that's great. And, and you know what? I think services like navigation, which you guys have uh, put a lot of effort into, is such an important part because our mental health system for kids with ASD is so fragmented, so confusing. Having somebody there to help you navigate the system can be a real benefit. 
Let's right. talk about medication. That's a topic that comes up uh, a lot. And I'm just going to real quickly land on the two most common mental health challenges that kids with ASD have, ADHD and anxiety disorders. Okay. And uh, for ADHD, you know, although medication is commonly used, we mustn't forget the importance of behavioral strategies that can help improve attention and, uh, and concentration <clears throat> uh, and so forth. So there are strategies that are out there. Some of them are available. Many of them are available online, Triple P, uh, other kinds of parenting strategies, some of the work by Russ Barkley on ADHD. All that seems to work for kids with ASD um, as well. We're also, there's been quite a bit of work about medication. If the behavior strategies don't work, it's quite reasonable to move to medication, methylphenidate, atomoxetine, guanfetine. Uh, all those have been shown to be effective. Methylphenidate, probably the one to use first, um, and then uh, atomoxetine uh, uh, later on. People have been using atypical antipsychotics, so these are drugs like Abilify or Risperidone. Uh, you know, we encourage less and less. We, I guess we discourage the use of atypical antipsychotics, yeah. except in very rare, case, rare cases. So stay away from that if uh, you possibly can. And then... Not generally something... Is that generally something that would be right. done after the typical drugs, the sort of the the general ADHD drugs aren't working, that they move to the atypical antipsychotics, or is is it? Yeah, not you know what? Good? I would only go to an antipsychotic uh, if you went first to a subspecialty center uh, that you know has expertise in ASD. So Holland Bloorview, Cam H, um, you know. McMaster, uh, London, CPRI. So only use those antipsychotics if you've really seen a specialist who knows uh, what they're doing about those medications because they're, they're unpleasant. Okay. But methylphenidate is uh, quite a reasonable medication uh, and it seems to work quite well. And there's evidence that diet should be considered, that that's part of it? Uh, well, no. So I think the evidence for diet is still emerging. Okay. And so I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't do anything until the final word comes out, which should be fairly, I think, you know, fairly soon. Because I've been hearing stuff about like red dye that you find in Doritos and things like that as being, that's all just speculation at this point. Yeah, the dye is, but sugar isn't. Okay. So, no, really not. So, no. Yeah, so you wouldn't want your kid on high sugar diets. Uh, that you know that will be that'll be uh, an issue. But that's true for typically developing kids as well. Yeah, for sure. Okay, anxiety. So so anxiety uh, uh, treatments. The good news is that CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, which is the first line treatment for anxiety disorders and typically developing kids also works in kids with ASD. The kids, uh, uh, you need a fair bit of verbal ability. So kids who are nonverbal or who have an intellectual disability, not going to work for those kids. Uh, uh, but certainly CBT, uh, good evidence that it seems to work. Uh, <clears throat> people have been using uh, antidepressant medication, anti-anxiety medication in kids with anxiety problems. So SSRIs and tricyclics, TCAs. And uh, so far for the number of clinical trials are out there and none of them have shown benefit in ASD. So here's an example where a medication works in typically developing kids, but doesn't seem to work in kids with um, ASD. Wow. And the sad news is, is that uh, there are no clinical trials. So here there's a lack of evidence for CBT for kids with depression. 
So my recommendation is, well, until the trials get completed and some are being done as we speak, even here in Toronto, um, that CBT can be tried for kids for depression, but we just, you know, aren't confident that it's uh, that it's going to work. But again, I would, I, my practice has changed, and I less and less prescribe medication for anxiety in uh, kids with ASD, and focus more on stress reduction, anticipation, and prevention when it comes to anxiety issues. Okay. So what is, let's talk about COVID-19. It's changed the world. We're all doing things differently. And uh, as we, as we all are, are, are really aware, uh, watching this webinar in the middle of the day, um, what, um, what, uh, what do we need to know about the challenges of, uh, of COVID-19, how, how it impacts this community? Yeah. So, um, so what a time of learning for everybody. And, and, uh, uh, we, I just to, I'm taking this information from an article that Stephanie Amos and Min Chuang Lei, who are colleagues of mine at CAMH in the Child and Youth Program at CAMH, we've just written a little paper on mental health challenges in COVID-19 among ASD kids. And I've listed uh, them there um, as to what the things are. I don't think they're going to be a surprise to anybody. Um, no. I think one thing we're learning is physical health, sleep, bowel habits you know if there's more less exercise less walking around more screen time that's going to have an impact on physical health sleep lead to more constipation so you know be careful about that time and uh, if families are um, all packed together in the in the house you know we our kids with ASD they need quiet time to reduce overstimulation so that can be a stress for them. So one bit of advice is to make room for, you know, quiet time uh, for kids, private space so that they can kind of decompress. And then, of course, the impact on families, I just know how difficult it is. There are some silver linings, you know. Yeah. Uh, some parents I've talked to find homeschooling not a bad thing. Less stress, less, cyber, you know, it might prevent bullying at school, cyberbullying, these are big issues. Reduce social pressure. Uh, so I think these are short-term benefits. I'm not sure they benefit the kid in the long term. And here, again, I think, you know, we're going to see more and more telehealth, virtual technology. I think that's a silver lining that we're going to learn how to use and will be the new normal for us. And um, it's tough getting supports in the best of times, but um, in this in this time, I know we've already talked about the telehealth side of it. But what um, what do we need to know about getting support during COVID nineteen? Well, it might surprise you, but we're we're not busy. We clinicians, psychiatrists, and social social workers and psychologists, you know, uh, you know, we're under capacity. We've got free time, so now's the time. Uh, people aren't coming to see us, right? People aren't coming to the emergency room, uh, uh, which, you know, which is good. Uh, not Emergency room is not the place to get crisis service. So my only point is, is that as far as I know, all the mental health ASD services are open for business. Um, it may be virtual, but they're, you know, eager to be part of it, uh, be part of the solution. And I think I've just list, listed some of the, uh, oh, I, I missed Autism Ontario on that list, but that's obviously there. Kids Helpline, About Kids Health is a Sick Kids website. It's got some great yeah. stuff on autism. Yeah. Autism Speaks Canada does. And, of course, Autism Ontario has a fantastic one. I don't know if parents know about youth wellness hubs. Okay. And they, these are relatively recent development for mental health services for kids. And there are about eight of them in the city of Toronto anyway. And they're now <clears throat> being spread out around the province. So uh, these are virtual, these are walk-in clinics. Now, they're virtual now, but before yeah. the pandemic, you could walk in without a referral um, and get some 
identify what the problems were, and then that could be supported at that wellness hub or a referral could be made to a more appropriate service. So I think these youth wellness hubs are a fantastic new innovation in Ontario's toolbox for mental health and uh, want to make sure people are aware of that. And then, you know, the final thing that parents need to take care of themselves, lower pressure, lower expectations. I know how much pressure there is, but you got to take care of yourself uh, you know, and make sure you're working together as a family, working as a team, and not getting too stressed out by what's going on. Yeah, it's challenging times for people, everyone, uh, with the, with everything that is going on. And so, important words. Before we go to your conclusion, we've got, somehow, we've got five minutes on the clock. And so, I'm going to try and get some questions from our audience answered, um, if that's okay with you. But I will give you an opportunity to close before we your conclusion before we close out. Um, I may, um, first question is, um, I have a child who's generally cooperative and willing to learn and help out on occasion. He has an episode where he gets upset and it takes me completely off guard. I'm able to bring him back pretty quickly, but I'm wondering what am I missing, um, to reading the cues he might be giving me before his episode so I can help identify it and, and, and be ready for it when it does, when it does occur. So, um, so that's a tricky one, but um, I, I would say two things. One, there is something that's precipitating it. So when people say, oh, it happens spontaneously or whatever, I'm skeptical. So there, often with these behavioral challenges, there is something that precipitates it. It just it may not be obvious. And the reason it may not be obvious is that you may be thinking of a, uh, what's a precipitant for a t- typically developing kid or a sibling, not for somebody with ASD. So some ways to be a good parent with ASD, you have to be, be able to put on an ASD brain. You have to see the world the way an ASD kid would see the world, the way your ASD kid would see the world. And that may not be the world that you see normally or typically. So it may be smells, lights, colors, routine, time span. It, it may be something really weird that is precipitating that behavior, but there is something. And here's where working with specialists who know about ASD can be really helpful in that problem solving. You know, it really does take a team to support a kid with ASD uh, over the over the lifespan, it takes a village. A quick question on um, going all the way back to the beginning: Do reproductive assistive technologies affect spontaneous genetic variants? Great question. Um, uh, there's been some work on this. It's been a little confusing. A couple of studies say yes. A couple of studies say no. I think. It's probably no, because the positive studies got mixed up with older parents. So we know older parents are a risk factor. So if you take out the older parents who had assisted uh, technologies, it's probably not a a factor in and of itself. Did, Did that make sense? Yeah, perfectly, perfectly. One more question, and then we're going to conclu- go to move to conclude and wrap up. This uh, this viewer wants to thank you for addressing girls with ASD. She has a daughter who's diagnosed at 14. Do you have any tips for addressing psychiatrists or medical doctors who disagree with her diagnosis because she shows empathy when she makes eye contact? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've heard this story so many times. Uh, you know, girls have better social skills than boys, right? Matt, you yeah. and I don't have as good social skills as our wives. I can, uh, uh, I can, I, I can tell you that. So, so that's why girls with ASD have better social skills than boys with ASD, but the medical professionals are still stuck on a boy with ASD and using that stereotype to think about girls so um people need to uh people just need to be 
encouraged to read the latest evidence about about girls and some of the studies out there. Um, and uh, maybe if uh, you know we could post some of those articles for people to look at uh, on the Autism Ontario website. My, if you're interested in this, my colleague Min Shuang Lei at CAMH is one of the world's experts on ASD and girls. He's got a ton of really interesting things to say. We've covered the topic a couple of times. I'm sure the information is there, but that is great to point out. Um, that is all the time that we have today. So I'm gonna give you an opportunity, Peter, to wrap up um, and give your moment of zen or, or wrap up the presentation that we had today um, before we go to close. Well, it's been a great uh, opportunity to share thoughts with people and new ideas and and where things are going i you know want to just end by saying that uh, asd is a a very complex disorder and it changes over time Um, there are we need to think of physical and developmental and mental health challenges that come and go over time Um, and that the the good news story is that all asd kids do get better but the rate of growth and um, the time it takes will vary between different kids. So patience, anticipation, and prevention uh, are the, the things that are worth emphasizing in this uh, journey. Excellent. And with that, Peter, I want to apologize to you uh, for some of the technical difficulties. Thank you for um, for bearing with us and, and getting through that. It was a it was a great presentation. So thanks so much for uh, for joining us today. Um, for everybody else, um, you know, if your questions were not answered, like always here at Autism Ontario, we will aspire to get you those answers after the fact. I uh, recommend that everybody visit the resource um, um, or the handout section before we leave for the day and um, and have a look at um, the various items that are in there, including this great book, which we are going to be doing a draw to hand out um, so that we can give away some of the copies to all of you. There's a lot of great information there, as well as a lot of other great resources. Anything that um, you need that we haven't covered today, you're looking for more information on, go to the uh, um, um, connect with us virtually section of the Autism Ontario website. There you'll find your service navigators as well as a ton of past webinars on these topics. Remember, this webinar will be recorded, archived, and available in that section by tomorrow and alongside all the other ones. So you can go ahead and let your friends, family, loved ones, caregivers, maybe maybe your doctor um, or your psychiatrist for that person who asked the question, um, but they can come in here and watch. The more people we get through this program, the better it is uh, for Autism Ontario the better it is for awareness and the better it is for the overall uh, community. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your patience today. I'd like to thank you for your attention and we look forward to seeing you on our next Autism Ontario event.